Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Last month, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association announced new blood pressure guidelines, again. (laughs) And that will significantly increase the number of Americans who, according to the new numbers, have blood pressure that's too high. The committee that drafted the new guidelines substantially lowered the blood pressure range of what is now considered normal. 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 For normal. <laughs> that means that people whose blood pressure used to be considered prehypertension or high normal will now be considered elevated blood pressure or stage one hypertension. This change will affect more than 30 million Americans. So why the new guidelines and what does it mean? Here to discuss the new guidelines is Mayo Clinic nephrologist Dr. Sandra Taylor. Dr. Taylor is also a member of the writing committee that drafted the new guidelines. Welcome to the program, Dr. Taylor. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So you change the finish line or the low bar or the high bar, however you want to put it, and it kind of changes the race a little bit. Um, Yeah. Uh, It's not a race, (laughs) and uh, I think... um, there's solid evidence to support lower levels for blood pressure uh, goals for people who have normal blood pressure and people who have elevated blood pressure. So you've pretty much changed the whole definition of what is high blood pressure. Yes, this is a a big deal, this guideline. Um, It's the first guideline in 14 years uh, on a national level that has endorsement from multiple different professional organizations that are expert, include experts in high blood pressure. So it's a big deal, and um, it's almost, you could say, overdue. You were you're kind of on a, on the hot seat though, aren't you? I mean, you were on the committee that that wrote the new guidelines. Have, has there been some pushback? Has there been some controversy about the new guidelines? Well, I think it's early. Um, the The comments that I hear from people around me are, "Oh, I better watch my blood pressure a little more. Maybe you know this is something important that I need to pay attention to." Um, I've had uh, patients that I see push back a little bit when I say that uh, a normal blood pressure is, you know, less than 120 and that if they have blood pressure above 130, that is uh, appropriate to be treated. So I think that um, patients, um, the public will need to understand what this is about, and it may take a little time to get used to. Well, it also just gets it on people's radar about blood pressure, that's a good conversation to have. So what exactly, or what causes high blood pressure? Yeah, um, first of all, I don't think we totally know. Hmm. High blood pressure uh, uh, is more likely as you age, um, and it occurs with age in societies that eat a high salt diet. So presumably there's some relationship between sodium or salt intake and stiffening blood vessels that causes high blood pressure. It tends to run in families, but even if you don't have it in your family, if you live long enough, you're likely to develop high blood pressure. So you could almost consider it um, a rite of passage, something that is very common with age it's uh, a little bit hard to understand that that there are so now uh, there are not that many of us who are actually spared the diagnosis of having high blood pressure i mean the new statistics show that under the the new guidelines more than 100 million people that's more than 45 percent of american adults have high blood pressure right and if you how can it be well, actually, if you look at adults over 65, you'd probably, it would be about 90%. Yeah. So it has to do with age. So uh, in 20 year olds, it's not very common. In 30, a little more, 40s, 50s, et cetera. So that overall 45% is really skewed toward uh, older age individuals. Just like it took us a long time to figure out that smoking not only caused lung cancer, but also caused cardiovascular disease, has it taken us a long time to figure out that there was such a strong relationship between high blood pressure and kidney disease, heart disease, stroke, et cetera? I mean, these guidelines have come down and down and down over the years. 
Right. They started back in the 1960s, 1970s, but there were there were trials even back then. The VA Cooperative Study is a, a famous landmark study. It was one of the first studies where they treated people with high blood pressure and started to prevent cardiovascular disease. Now, at that time, it was based on diastolic blood pressure, the lower blood pressure number, and these were uh, men with very high blood pressure who were treated and the results were dramatic. The number of people who had, you know, even fatal events was markedly reduced with blood pressure treatment. Which one of those numbers is the more important one, the upper one or the lower one? Or explain what those mean. Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, systolic blood pressure is the blood pressure when the heart beats. That's the upper number when you get a reading. Diastolic blood pressure is the pressure between beats when the heart rests, So, and that's the lower number. Initially, um, it was thought that diastolic blood pressure was the most important one. When your and, heart is resting. Yeah, yeah. when your mm -hmm. heart is resting. And the early studies and all of the recommendations were based on the diastolic blood pressure. But over the years, we found that actually systolic blood pressure, the upper number, correlates with risk, risk for heart disease, risk for stroke, risk hmm. for kidney disease, much more so. And hmm. so now, uh, uh, for many years, but, but more so in recent years, the focus has been on systolic, the upper number. So tell us about the, the, uh, the new guidelines and how you're going to help patients get their blood pressure lower. Will it require a lot more, more people to be on uh, blood, blood pressure medication, or are you going to advocate more for lifestyle change? So um, it may sound a little complicated. I'll, I'll try to explain this very simply. So, uh, Tracy, you talked about that um, normal is less than 120, systolic and less than 80 diastolic this elevated range is 120 to 129 systolic and so in that range um, we would just tell people to you know keep an eye on it and and limit their salt try to keep their weight down sort of lifestyle practices but it's it doesn't require treatment the the big change is um when you get to a systolic pressure of 130 to 139, or a diastolic pressure of 80 to 89. Now that's gonna be called stage one hypertension. And in that situation, everybody would be advised to follow, to change lifestyle practices, to follow lifestyle um, modifications that would lower your overall cardiovascular risk and lower your risk uh, or lower your blood pressure actually. For a subgroup of those people, if they have already have heart disease, already have had a stroke or heart failure, um, if they're diabetic, if they have kidney disease, those individuals, we would start on medication as well as lifestyle practices at 130 or higher. So that's a change. What are the lifestyle changes that people can make starting right now? Right. So I'll give you a list, and um, um, all of these are, are good options. So first of all is weight loss. Get your weight down to a normal body weight. Maybe not just under obese would be a good starting goal. Um, second, limit your salt intake. That would be sodium. You need to read the labels to do that. Third, regular exercise, aerobic or resistance training, 90 to 150 minutes a week. Um, fourth, limit alcohol moderation. So no more than two drinks a day for men, one drink a day for women. And I suppose it goes without saying, no smoking. No smoking. <laughs> yeah. All right, you have certainly uh, emphasized the fact that high blood pressure is extremely important. And the other important thing we ought to tell our listeners is you got to go in and get it checked because you yeah. can't tell what it is. It's an asymptomatic condition. They used to call it the silent killer. Maybe they still do. Still do. Thanks so much for updating us on the guidelines. Dr. Sandra Taylor, nephrologist at the Mayo Clinic, kidney specialist. Thanks for being here. Thank you.